Val Garland, welcome to Show Studio. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm glad you think so. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover um, in not a lot of time, so, um, but I do really want to start by asking what your first kind of memory of beauty was, your first beauty memory. <clears throat> My first beauty memory? Um, oh, it would probably be Revlon Toasty Beige that was on my mum's dressing table. Um, she used to wear this sort of like toffee coloured sort of foundation. And uh, yeah, I think, I, I think that's my first memory. I think that must have been in the, um, I don't know, in the 60s. And uh, were you playing dress up, having fun copying your mum or? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, yes. Tango oranged face matched the tango orange hair. Yeah. <laughs> so you had red hair back then? Sorry? You had red hair back then? I did. When I was growing up, my hair was quite red. And it wasn't until I got to the age of 12 that I thought being a blonde would be so much more fun. <laughs> so I started putting vim on my hair, uh, vim and water, and then going out in the sun. So basically I was sort of like chemically bleaching my hair with household products. You know, my mother would look at me in, in her Irish accent, sort of say, you know, how weird it was that my hair was sort of like blonde on the ends and dark at the roots. <laughs> Little did she know. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like kind of the early stages of this wonderful experimentation you have because in researching you there's so much fantastic imagery, particularly in your book, of kind of shaved heads and wild hair and amazing kind of experimentation, paint streaks and all this fantasy. When did that kind of start? Is it the bleaching that's triggered this amazing experimentation? <clears throat> well, when I... Um, this is going to sound really funny, but when I was born, um, I was born with a funny shaped head. Okay. Um, I was born with a funny shaped head, so um, my forehead is very pointed. And um, because my parents thought I would have a problem with this at school, they sat me down when I was about four years old and said, um, uh, you know, your forehead is different to other kids. And I'm like, yes, I know. And they said, do you know why that is? And I said, no. And they said, that's because you're very special. And um, so I knew I was different. And I wanted everybody else to share in that um, difference. So I think at about the age of um, seven, when I was at school, and people were calling me egghead, I, I counterbalanced that by shaving the front of my hair off so that everybody could see this incredible um, bump of knowledge that my father said I had and I think it sort of like started then mm. and my sister was um, my sister was and is extremely gorgeous she was very sort of Ursula undress at like the age of 10 12 and I thought mm, well I don't want to be like that I want to be different um, I want to be noticed but I don't want to be like everybody else I you know I quite like being the strange one mm. so I think that's where it started <laughs> and so, we're talking about this experimentation a little bit before that, you were kind of training to be a hairdresser at one point, and so this is kind of the first chop that well, took you there. Well, I'll correct you there. Okay. I didn't train to be a hairdresser as such. Um, I, I sort of like trained for about, uh, I think it was a year and a half and then decided that um, I just wanted to do hair without completing the training. And I didn't, I didn't really want to be a hairdresser. Um, when I was at school, I wanted, to, I wanted to be a writer or a journalist or something that I thought was um, intelligent and uh, definitely something that would involve travel. Mm. Um, but I was always, always a bit of a hothead and I had a, had a bit of an argument with the careers um, teacher and um, I basically told him, you know, what he could do with his plans for me <laughs> and just walked out of school. And then I thought, oh God, I've got to get a job, I've got to get a job. And so I thought, I know, my sister was a hairdresser and I thought, that looks easy. I'll go and, I'll go and be a hairdresser. So I was very, um, I was very sort of, sort of, Let's give it a go. What if? Why not? Um, I always thought that 
if you believed in yourself, you could do anything. And uh, I thought, well, if I don't like hairdressing, then um, I can do something else, you know, as long as you're being creative, mm. you know. And when I started doing hairdressing, it was a very interesting time, um, you know, because uh, lots of different things were happening in hair and you could teach hairdressing and you could travel with hair. And um, so I started teaching from an early age and um, yeah, you know, so I was a hairdresser, but then I wasn't committed to it. And I, I think it was at, at the age of 16 or 17 that I met my future husband and um, I was doing something else then. I'd given up hairdressing because I was bored. I get bored very quickly. Mm. And um, I was working for the British Aircraft Corporation. Actually, the very fun funny story behind that is I was a hairdresser. And I thought, OK, I think I've got this. I want to do something else. And in all the local magazines at the time, um, there used to be all these little ads. And it would be, the future is computers. Learn, train to be a computer programmer. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's scientific, that's what I'm gonna do. So, uh, I get this job um, to train as a computer programmer. And I do that, uh, I think the training was like about, I don't know, I think it was only even a day and so, and I, I end up in this job, and it's on my first day, and I'd been used to being a hairdresser, and um, they said, I, you know, we were there, and we were sort of like programming into this computer, so it was a bit like sort of like typing, and the computer was like massive, it was like <laughs> huge. And I remember saying to, in my 15 minute break, saying to the girl who was next to me, I said like, nobody talks. And she said, no, 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 you're not allowed to talk, you've just got to get on with the job. And, and I said, so how do they pay you? And she said, you get paid monthly. And I was like, monthly? You know, I'm used to going out with my weekly wage and buying seven pairs of shoes, <laughs> you know. So, so, uh, uh, and so that was my first day on the job. And on my first day, I said, how long do you have to give notice, you know, if you want to leave? And they sort of said, a month. And on my first day of being a computer programmer, I handed in my notice. So I was only there for one day. <laughs> Still something for the CV. Um, and so this boredom really seems like a running theme throughout your career. Yeah. Once you computer programming, back to hairdressing, but it was the boredom that kind of rocketed you all the way to Australia for such a long time. Um, kind of tell me about that progression. I just think, um, uh, the easy, easiest way to explain it is that um, I was with my then husband, who I married very quickly, mm. um, and um, you know he was a drummer in a band, and I was this hairdresser. And one night we were out walking, and he sort of said, "Oh, I'm really bored." And both of us kind of looked about, looked a bit like Sid and Nancy. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm really bored. And I'm like, oh, God, yeah, I'm really bored too. And he's like, let's go somewhere. And I was like, yeah, let's go somewhere. I remember that I'm a kid from Bristol. Um, you know, he could have said, let's go to London. Um, and I thought he was going to say, let's go to Paris. But he said, let's go to Australia. And I'm like, yeah, all right, yeah, why not? And so we literally, we, we came to London to the Australian High Commission. And, uh, you know, they were looking for hairdressers. They weren't looking for drummers, but they were looking for engineers, and that was his, like, other job. And they said, well, where do you want to go in Australia? And I said, well, where's the hottest place? <laughs> so we ended up in Perth, Western Australia, which is really hot. And, uh, and that was it. And, you know, but it was a great, for me, it was a great awakening because, um, you know, this was like 1979 and we were sort of like leaving England and all of the doom and gloom of the three day week and suddenly I was in Australia and if you were, it felt like this to me at the time, if you were English, then 
you know, everybody loved you and, you know, you could get a job easily. And I think within 14 months of being there, I, I was a partner in a salon. And I think, um, if I remember correctly, um, you know, three years after I was there, I had my own salon. You know, it was just, it just made, it just opened up my mind mm -hmm. um, to like, if you want it, just go and get it. You know, just go and get it. That's like amazing fearlessness, just taking this huge leap. Well, yeah, I just, I've, I always, and I think, I think when you're younger, you have that, you have that gung-ho, you mm. can do anything. Um, it's only um, perhaps as you mature, you know, perhaps you get a little more safe. But I've always thought, well, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter, try something else, you know. It's yeah. an amazing confidence, I think. Um, and I really, really am dying to talk to you about this salon because from what I've been researching, it just sounds like such a hub of energy at the time. Um, and you're quite the force to be reckoned with at this salon. Um, I'm dying to know about your staff and what they were wearing and um, the clientele. Can you tell me a little bit about Oh, it was... Um, it... Okay. <laughs> I was never, and I think the lot, I think, I, okay, I was never in it, and I don't think any of us were, mm. I was never into whatever it was I was doing for the money. It wasn't about the money, it was about doing something that was exciting and different. And remember, this is the 80s, and we're all a bit new romantic. And when you think about hairdressing salons, at that time, they, you know, a lot, yeah, there were some funky ones, but, you know, a hairdressing salon notoriously had, like, you know, magazines from six months ago, and you had to pay for your conditioner if you wanted them to give you conditioner. And it was just, it was just a little bit normal. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I want to do a salon that I'd want to go to, and what kind of a salon do I want to go to? I want to go to a nightclub. I want to go to a nightclub, you know, and I want to hear great music, and I want to drink great coffee, and I want the latest magazine on the table, not thumbed. Kind of a bit like show studio, really. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You sort of feel like, and a bit of a sort of an art gallery thing, and, and I used to paint I used to paint these paintings and, um, you know, I'd do it at night, or this sort of like frantic painting, and then I'd hang them in the salon. But I was too embarrassed to tell anyone that it was my work. <laughs> you know, they'd sort of say, oh, you've got that artist again. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, what's your name? And I'm like, um, it's Fran, Fran Sweeney. <laughs> it's my, you know, that's my second name and that's my maiden name. And, because uh, I didn't know if anybody would like it or not, because it was always, always quite apocalyptic, you know. Um, yeah, like sort of um, burnt dolls and things like this. But, um, yeah, so it was a mad salon. And when I would interview people, I would say, um, come to work like you're going clubbing. Mm. You know, do not wear that little nice dress because it doesn't work for me. You know, I want full makeup. I want hair, you know. Um, yeah, you know. I mean, I used to have this outfit that I used to wear, that I used to put my scissors in, and it was colostomy underwear. And I used to wear it on the outside because it was this sort of like dirty dishwater pink, and I used to keep my scissors in there. Um, yeah, and you know, yeah. They used to, um, yeah, I always liked to be a different character, you know, and I liked my staff to be different characters. And um, we had a lot of fun in that salon. You know, and sometimes we'd be open till like one o'clock in the morning, you know, and the music would be going and, um, yeah, it, it was becomes wild. A, becomes a destination for everyone. Well, it was, and it was in a great place. I mean, where it was is dead now um, because it was in um, Paddington on the border of Darling It Hurts, Darlinghurst, um, and it was right next door to the biggest gay, um, pub in Sydney and it was right opposite this great nightclub so it was this kind of like three-way triangle of people would come and have their hair done go next door to the pub then go over 
to the club till whenever, you know. And um, yeah, it was good. That sounds amazing. So what dragged you back? What dragged you back to London? <coughs> Excuse me, what dragged me back to England? Um, I guess, okay, so I had been doing hair and I had a great clientele and, you know, um, there was a three month waiting list um, to get me to cut your hair and no one got discount. Everyone paid the same price, regardless of whether you were an editor or, you know, in a band or whatever, mm. you know, because I wanted it to appeal to, um, you know, the mother in Parramatta as it did to, you know, the designer. And anyway, so I had all these regular clients <coughs> and I guess I just got a little bored. And so I had lots of friends that were photographers, lots of friends that were photographers and makeup artists and models because they all used to come to the salon. Mm. And um, I started testing with these photographers and, um, and I used to wear tons of makeup, tons. And, you know, I'd sort, of, I'd sort of paint silly pictures on my face, you know. And I always, I probably looked quite frightful, but I didn't care as long as people looked. And um, so people kept asking me to do the makeup, do the makeup, do the makeup. And I was like, no, 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 I'm quite happy doing hair. And then um, one day I was doing this shoot and the makeup artist, I think they planned it, the makeup artist didn't turn up. And they sort of said, well, you're going to have to do the makeup, Val. And I said, well, I've only got what I always wear, which is like black, white, and red. You know? <laughs> so there'd be a red lip, a, a big black eye, and my face would be sort of like white, a little bit like scarlet. And um, yeah, so, so I, start, you know, I started doing some shoots with some friends. And I was very lucky that a dear friend of mine who's no longer with us, um, Stephen Price, he, um, he was a makeup artist who wanted to be a photographer. And um, yeah, we were coming back from a funeral, one of our friends, you know, um, had died and he sort of said, oh look, I want to take pictures. And I said, well, yeah, I think I want to do makeup. <laughs> and so we started testing together, you know. And where I corrected you earlier on and said, oh, I want to correct you there, um, it was, that I'm not a trained hairdresser mm. and I'm not a trained makeup artist. You know, I'm, I'm predominantly self-taught. And I think um, back in the day when I started, there weren't very many self-taught makeup artists or hairdressers. You know, everybody did a training, but it's completely different now. Yeah, completely different now. Do you think that gave you a little bit of an edge back in the day? Well. I think, I think not knowing the right way to do something um, perhaps means that you do it instinctively. And I think that um, I would just do something and if it looked good, I'd be happy with it. But if it didn't, I'd just take it off and do something else. Mm. You know, I think, I think it is important to know the rules so that you can break the rules. But I think that um, creative things, doing something creative, whatever it is you're doing, whether you're cutting a dress or, or painting a picture, it's very, it's very, it's instinctive you know, if you want to be considered an artist. And I think there are people that are great technicians and they know exactly how to do something every step of the way. And then there are people that are um, what I would call visionaries or, or they're instinctive. They just do it because it feels right. Mm. And, um, you know, sometimes you can look at something and maybe it's not symmetrical but it looks great it looks really great you know because it's just a bit off and i think i've always liked the idea of uh you have perfection and then you just destroy it a little bit or or you know it's lived in or 
you know, it's maybe four hours later or something. So um, it becomes part of you, mm. you know, or the whole. And I think um, it was funny, um, I got asked recently to do a beauty story. And I met the photographer and I'd never met the photographer before. And um, they came in and sat down in my kitchen. And I said, you know, uh, I hate beauty stories. I hate the idea of beauty story. I hate the, oh, this is the latest eye. This is the lip. Oh, this is the, this is the cheekbone. This is the three quarter, the way the makeup looks good. Mm. It's so boring. It's so boring. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather make a great picture you know, that everything works together, you know, because then it's, it becomes more of a character and it's more of a story. You can shut me up now because you started me chatting. <laughs> keep going, don't worry, keep going, keep, keep going. going you know. Do you think makeup has to kind of tell a story? Is it trying to tell someone something? Well, I think it's whatever you want it to be. And um, I always say to everyone that would I put it on my wall? Do I want to look at that forever? You know, is it, will it be, re re blah, 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 will it be relevant in 10 years time, 20 years time, 50 years time? Then it's a great moment, mm. you know, it's a great makeup. Um, because it's different if you do makeup for the catwalk or theater or uh, paparazzi, um, or, yeah, the red carpet, it's different. Excuse me, I'm gonna cough. <coughs> it's different when you are creating a picture mm. or a moving image because um, that's it, it's there. It needs to look a certain way. And I want it to feel, I like it to feel like everything be belongs together and you've created a character. You know, if you, back in the day, you would do a beauty shoot, perhaps, and the hair would be scraped back so that you can see the beauty. Boring. Mm. You know, I want whatever's happening here, or, or who is that person? You know, you need the hair, you need the great lighting, you need the great photographer, you need everything to fit together. So yes, I want to tell a story I think I'm a storyteller and I like to see a story when I'm looking at a visual. And this kind of idea of storytelling and narrative is so prevalent in some of the people you work with, particularly McQueen. I'm fascinated by um, the kind of conversations that you, Katie and McQueen were having back in the day about these concepts, these narratives, and, and then having to then tell models that they're going to have their face peeled back and this new Botox beauty. Um, that must have been kind of, I know that also Lee isn't the most, wasn't the most easy person to work with in terms of makeup. There was a lot of kind of back and forth. Um, so how does that work when you're given a narrative, particularly with someone like Lee? Particularly with somebody like Lee. 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 Um, it's great. It is great when you're given a narrative because it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, with Lee, um, there would be that narration, but then he would expect you to take it somewhere else. So it's like, look at this 18th century painting or this Joel Whitkin book, and now let's put another spin on it. You know, where can we take it so that it feels, you know, fresh or, 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 yeah, it just feels fresh. It just feels of the moment. So, um, you know, it, it, we would have the time to have the time to research and try things out. You know, we'd sort of probably spend about a month before me and whoever the hairdresser was, usually Guido, um, trying things out, you know, and Polaroiding everything and you know, um, the, and, and we'd have to take this imagery to Katie um, because she would have to approve it before it even got to Lee, you know. And then, you know, when you get to that final moment where Lee is happy with what, 
what you've brought to the table, that could all change. That could all change. You know, maybe you've got a call time, an eight hour call time for a seven, 7 a.m. call time of eight hours. Um, so you go to bed early the night before, knowing that, you know, you're going to be up at 5.30 to be at the show for seven. And then you get a call from, you know, Sam Gainsborough's office at, I don't know, 11.30. Lee wants you. Lee wants you on set for 1:30 to check the hair and makeup, to check the makeup in the lighting. So you've now got to go and do that, you know, and get final approval, and still be at the show at seven, you know. So, the, but you know, the thing about working with Lee was, um, it, you know, it was the adrenaline, mm. you know, and we were all striving for this fantastic moment. And, you know, I always laugh, you know, because people sort of said, oh, you know, that must have been amazing, it must have been working for Lee. And I'm like, it was amazing. We never got paid for it. <laughs> you know, we never got paid, we did it for the love. You know, I used to pay my assistants. I used to pay my assistants, like give them all sort of like 50 quid cash and, you know, maybe a touche eclat light reflecting pen that I'd bought myself, but I wouldn't get paid, you know, but it was never, ever, ever about the money. Mm -mm. It was about, you know, the vision. Yeah, everyone just has this like innate passion and gut feeling to create this fantastic final product. Yeah, and you know, I mean, we were in love with what we did, but we were also terrified, <laughs> you know, because you didn't know, you know, at any moment whether it was all going to kick off. You know, I remember being with Katie England and, you know, Lee and Katie wanted this particular orange, shade of orange for the lip. And, um, and I, th I can't remember which show this was. Might have been the, it's the one where they had the flippy hair in London. Gone. Um, anyway, Katie wanted this particular shade of orange lipstick. Could we find it? Did it exist? No. <laughs> I think at the end, um, Katie actually found it in a pound shop, this one lipstick um, somewhere in Kilburn, and that ended up being the shade the colour that was used for the show. You know. It's crazy. It's fantastic. Oh. There's moments like that just uh, so amazing. And we mentioned Katie quite a lot. There's amazing collaboration between you and Katie. She was the one that introduced you to Lee in the first place. But I'm interested um, in this idea of collaboration. Is there something you look back on and say, God, that was a real kind of amazing collaborative moment where everything just kind of came together at the final hour? Um, so which was my first moment? Is there a moment that you just felt, in hindsight... I've arrived. Gosh, yes, that's a fantastic collaborative moment. I've arrived. Well... <laughs> no, that's probably boring. You don't want to hear that. Um, I'll tell you anyway, and then you can cut it out. Yeah. My very first moment... <laughs> uh, my very first moment when I thought that I had arrived goes back to hairdressing. And I was just a salon hairdresser. But I used to cut everybody's hair. Um, you know, all the models came to me, the photographers, the musicians, you know. And um, I used to cut Michael Hutchins' hair. And I used to do all the band. And, um, but they couldn't use me for the videos because I was a salon hairdresser. I wasn't a session hairdresser, and, which was fine. Anyway, so it was like 10 o'clock at night and I'm cashing up the till. And I get a call from the stylist who's doing the video for um, In Excess. And um, she says, uh, um, oh, are you free? You know, um, Michael doesn't like the, the person who's doing his hair. And all I can hear in the background is Michael Hutchins screaming, get me fucking Val Garland. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is it, this is the moment, you know. And then I used to travel with the band everywhere. I did that for quite a few years. But anyway, so, but that was way before um, makeup. In makeup, well, I don't know how I, f I don't know when I felt um, 
I remember being with um, Katie and Phil Pointer and Alistair Mackey and Malcolm Edwards. And um, I think it was Alistair that said this. Phil, I think it was Phil took a Polaroid of us all together. It was Katie England, yeah, Alistair, me and Malcolm and Phil took, the pol took this Polaroid. And I remember Alistair picking up the Polaroid and going to me, oh, this is, this is history. You know, this is history. And I thought, oh, nah, you know, don't be silly. You know, <laughs> we're just doing our job. And um, so I don't think, I think when you're in it, you don't really know, you know, because you're in it and you're, and you don't think about those kind of things. You just, you just want to, you just want to make magic, mm. hopefully, you know. Let's talk about making magic because there's been so many amazing looks I think people instantly recognise as you and I really want to talk about this wonderful energy that you bring when you do makeup. It's anything goes, let's try a visceral reaction. Um, and part of that is this kind of Blue Peter kit bag that you have, which has amazing goodies. Um, and one of my favourite examples of this is the Gareth Pugh tights. Oh, and yeah. I just love that someone comes to you and says, we need this, and a magical bag of tricks arrives, and something gets pulled and transformed into one of the most memorable Gareth Pugh looks. Well, because I think for me, um, I, I think I am spontaneous, and I think I work best under pressure, and I think any time I think too much or plan too much, I just feel like it's, it's over-laboured. Mm. And uh, this, was, this was my first time going to work with Gareth Pugh, uh, do his show. I hadn't worked with him before. And um, I remember thinking, I have no idea what I'm going to do today. So best we pack the Sticky Beck plastic bag. So that comes along. And um, I remember Gareth saying, now what was it he said? He said, uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Lindsay Kemp. I'm thinking Lindsay Kemp. I'm thinking Donna Summer. I'm thinking uh, neon, um, glitter, definitely glitter. And I was like, right, okay, okay. And so for me, I wanted to go to the opposite of that, you know. And so I thought, well, blank canvas, blank canvas. And he, you know, he said he wanted an element of cloning. And I thought, well, yeah, blank canvas. And sometimes I might look at the sticky back plastic table or what have you, and it will just be something that means absolutely nothing, but it makes me think of something else. And uh, I think I said to um, Joey, who was working with me at the time, American tan tights. And she was kind of like, Kee! and I'm like, why American tan tights? I said, find me some American tan tights. I think they're in there somewhere. And we've got these couple of um, pictures. I think I've got them somewhere of me working it out in my head, putting the stocking, the tights over my head. So I look like some kind of like bank robber and working out how it was going to work. But it was just, it just happened, you know, and I like it when things just evolve, mm. you know. Um, yeah, that, that, that interests me a lot. And then Malcolm was doing great hair, you know. He had this kind of like mad, sort of like red, dark clown wig, which I thought was quite interesting. And it was funny, I mean, I can remember the casting director, <coughs> excuse me, freaking out. He came backstage at the show and he was freaking out because he was like, well, we can't see the girls, we can't see the girls. I mean, we don't, can't recognise who the girls are. I mean, who are they? And, but from the girls' point of view, they all loved it because suddenly it wasn't that kind of like no makeup, makeup. We want to see her the way she walked in. Mm. Um, suddenly they were a character, so they could be that character. And the interesting thing about that moment um, you don't see it in the pictures. But that moment, um, the way the tights were on the face, um, because you have a dip where your eye is, um, the tights sat over the top, so there was like a, a little gap there. So as the girls were mo moving down the catwalk, 
you could see their eyes flicker. So in one sense, they look like, you know, robotic dolls, but they were actually alive as well. I mean, it was quite spooky and you had to sort of like see it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I loved it. <laughs> There's all these wonderful kind of happy accidents, happy moments, kind of creating something completely new, which now we really take for granted. Everything feels very really commonplace now, but actually kind of spearheaded some really amazing techniques and ideas to shoot with Nick uh, Knight <laughs> um, for Dior, that kind of oily, slick body paint. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, that had never been done before. Yeah. You know, this was advertising. Um, this was couture clothes um, and normally, you know, you want to see the bag, you want to see the cuff, you want to see how it's made, everything needs to be perfect and that was what was so great about John, John and Nick and, you know, everybody else involved was that um, John said, yeah, let's just wet the clothes. So there's me and Sam McKnight with fans on either side with water sprays. So we're spraying into the fans and the fans are sort of like, you know, hitting the girls. And uh, yeah, it was uh, Giselle and Rhea Dunn, I think was in the very first one. And, um, you know, they needed to be oily. Um, but, and it needed to stay there. Mm. So there was an awful lot of Elizabeth Arden eight hour cream used on that shoot, <laughs> you know, um, but it was amazing. And uh, w w one moment that I loved was, um, excuse me, <coughs> was when I think it was Rhea Durham's stiletto was sort of like just digging into the thigh. You know, I often, um, uh, yeah, I, I do like a little bit of subversion, you know, and I think um, Nick wrote something about that in my book where he sort of talks about the fact that I come across as a, um, a schoolmistress, but actually, you know, she's a, really, she's a dominatrix or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I am. I just think that... Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it feels like there's a lot of wonderful kind of serendipitous moments and things just come together at the last moment, but do you f has it ever gone wrong? Oh, I'm sure it's definitely gone wrong. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. But, you know, I never think of something going wrong. Mm. I think, OK, that didn't work. Where do we go from here? You know, um, because sometimes out of out of a a mistake, let's say, comes something else. You know, sometimes I mean, you know, everyone has a good day, everyone has a bad day. You know, sometimes you just don't have a good makeup day, and it's not working. So I always think, well, it's only makeup. Take it off and try something else. And sometimes. You're halfway through taking it off, and suddenly it comes alive. And that's the right makeup, you know. Just have that magic moment where it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you also have to think about what's happening in the makeup room and how it looks in the makeup room. Mm. How's it going to look here? You know, really, I think we should all be doing hair and makeup on set in the lights, because that's the light. It transforms yeah. when it's out here. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. I want to talk, so we're talking a little bit about being on set, but actually you do a lot of show makeup, fashion week makeup. I've read some, a crazy statistic that one time you're doing five shows a day, which kind of seems impossible. And I'm definitely um, kind of reading that structure is definitely not something that you like, you like the energy and you get bored easy, as you say, but how on earth do you do five shows in a day? Well, I like, I do like spontaneity. Yes. But I also like um, running everything like a military operation. Okay. You know, um, some people would say that I'm OCD. I would say that I'm tidy. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have a team and we have a plan. 
So when we have a plan, then it can go to work. You know, it can work. And um, so how do I do five shows in a day? It involves a motorcycle. So, you know, I will go to one show and start off the show, um, you know, do a demonstration. I'm going to cough again. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have no, some don't water. You it's that Nick he gave me his gold. <laughs> Um, okay, so <clears throat> doing five shows in a day, I call it piggybacking. I'll go to the first show, I'll set up the look, um, I'll get the team started, um, and then <clears throat> I will go to the next show, um, set up the look, get them started. I will, uh, I will then get back on the motorbike and go back to the first show so that I can see how the show is doing. Um, there for rehearsal, um, make sure that you know my um, designer is happy with how the girls look in the light. Um, and then um, I'll have to get back to the next show for, to do the same thing again. Um, it's tight, but I've made it work. Mm. You know, and I think the thing that you have to be is you have to be honest with the designers that you're working with, you know. Um, and I've been very lucky um, that I have an incredible team of artists that work with me. Um, so I trust them. And the people that I've worked with that have employed me know that I've got a great team. Mm. So, you know, Val's going to be an hour late. Okay, fine. You know, um, no, there's never, never been a problem. Yeah, it's hugely impressive, even just carrying around all these ideas in your mind. Oh, I love it. Throughout all that day. I love it, and I love the fact that um, if someone says, oh, it can't be done, oh, let's find a way, let's find a <laughs> Red flag to a ball. Yeah, let's find a way, you know, I... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I love a challenge. Mm. Yeah, I love it. What's been the most challenging thing you've had to deal with so far? I think the, the most challenging, the most challenging situation I was ever in was quite a few years ago. Um, Charlotte Stockdale asked me, would I do the very first ever Fashion Rocks? And um, <clears throat> I said, yeah, why not? And she said, okay, so we are going to have 18 designers. Um, we're going to have 160 models. Um, and we are working um, in the basement, in the, in the, yeah, in the basement of the Albert, Albert Hall. And that's all tiny little um, sort of like caves, tiny little rooms. So we're working in there. I'm going to have 78 makeup artists. Wow. 78 makeup artists <laughs> in different rooms. I will have 18 separate teams of six, I think it's six, makeup artists, um, each doing a different designer. All the looks have got to be different. And we've got 160 models, and sometimes we're sharing the looks. Um, at the same time, um, I think um, Prince Charles and Camilla are going to be walking through backstage and we've all basically got to get out of the way. <laughs> so that's slowing us up. And then, um, and also at the same time, we've got um, uh, all these people on stage, like we've got Beyonce on stage. Um, I know we've got Bjork on stage. Um, I can't remember who else is on stage. Let's just say, but we've got a host of stars playing their music on stage, as well as the models going around. Mm. During all this mayhem, Lee McQueen comes backstage, finds me, 
he walks in with Bjork and he's all right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he's like, he handed me this bag of Swarovski crystals and said, I want you to cover Bjork's face. I don't know if you've talked like that, I can't remember. But I want you to cover <laughs> Bjork's face in crystals. Um, and she's on in an hour. And I'm like, I've got so much else to do. OK, OK, bye, bye, bye. So we get it done and there's three of us. Um, yeah, there's myself, there's Kate Lee, there's another makeup artist called Melanie, and the three of us, we're all, Melanie and Glazy, we're all there, and we're all sort of like putting these crystals on um, Bjork's face. And then she goes on stage, and she sort of like sings her song. And the thing about crystals, or glitter, or anything like that, is when you put light on it, it looks spectacular. So it was great on stage, on the show. Mm. Amazing. The next day, I think it was in the Sun or the Daily Mail, Bjork had been captured, because there was an after party. Lee had an after party that we all went to. And um, Bjork had said to me, would I take off some of the crystals? So it was just like this crystal mask. Fine. Anyway, so the next day, she is photographed in the paper They've snapped her, papped her, coming out of the after party, and she doesn't look good. No. The what looked amazing the night before, it, she looked like Hannibal Lecter. Oh no! You know, it, it just it was flat because the light wasn't on it, and I was yeah. like, oh god. And uh, yeah, that was a challenge. That well, it, it, it happened. I mean, it was great at the event, but. Um, you know, be careful who photographs your work. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Um, Bjork certainly isn't the only um, amazing singer you've worked with. Lady Gaga is one of the most um, iconic images that we have of yours with the cheekbones. And again, that, this is something that you really spearheaded, this whole kind of prosthetics idea, um, these fantastic cheekbones. Um, and I know from talking to Nick that it was quite the gruelling shoot. Um, was it just as gruelling in makeup? 15 hours, I believe, the shoot was, wasn't it, for Lady Gaga's Born This Way? <clears throat> yes. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, well, the, I'll tell you the backstory of how it came about. Please do, please okay. do. Um, so there we are. Um, we'd already started working with the royal we as me and Sam McKnight. <laughs> um, we were already, we'd already started working with Lady Gaga through Nick um, on some other projects. And um, in between the shows in Milan, um, Sam and I get a call to go and do Lady Gaga for some TV event. So anyway, we go there. And um, I'm doing her makeup, and Nicola Formichetti is there. And he's like, OK, so. Um, we've got this album cover coming up with Nick and we want to do something different with Gaga. You know, um, let's talk about hair and makeup ideas now. What are you thinking makeup, Val? And at that time, Gaga wore like four sets of lashes and she kind of, you know, she had a strong brow. And um, I said, OK. Uh, and, and she wore quite a lot of makeup. Um, as did most girls. Um, she, I said, OK, let's bleach Gaga's eyebrows, you know, which was, like, unheard of. I was like, let's get rid of the eyebrows. Um, I said, and let's get rid of the lashes. Let's just make it a lot more brutal, um, more sort of punky, really. And, like, let's do, like, a thick black sort of, like, liner. Let's put a stamp on it, make sure, you know, boom. And... Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah, that, let's just keep the foundation very sort of, like, creamy, like, devoid. You know, I think it was that sort of... I mean, I, I think a bit like Lee. I always love that idea of Botox beauty. I mean, that was, that was my thing. Mm. Somebody said, what do you call this kind of look that you're doing for Lee? And I'm like, it's Botox beauty, because Botox was quite controversial then. And... Um, so I said, oh, well, you know, I said, why don't we do some prosthetics? And Nicola was like, prosthetics? You know, like, 
what do you mean? I mean, nobody was really doing prosthetics then outside of, you know, um, film or special effects. It just, it wasn't really a fashion item. Mm. I said, oh, let's just give her pointed cheekbones. I said, you know, we could do pointed cheekbones and we could, we could do p pointed shoulders. Like, she, you know, she's got padded shoulders, but it's on the inside, like she's a super being. And um, they, they liked that. And uh, we weren't shooting. Oh, and, and they, no, Nicola said to me, explain it. Explain it. What, what do you mean? And I literally got two bits of paper and turned them into like two little paper aeroplanes, origami aeroplanes, and just placed them on the cheeks like this. And Nicola took a picture. Anyway, we were actually doing the magazine, we were doing the album cover about three months later. And um, I arrive on the morning of the shoot and um, there's a special effects guy there from, from Pinewood. And he brings up this tray and says, you know, um, I want, to, um, you know, are you happy with the prosthetics that you designed? You know, and I'm like, well, it was just two, two bits of paper <laughs> it was stuck on the cheek. You know, but that's how it started. And, um, but I did make a rod for my own back because she had to wear this look for like the whole sort of like tour every time she was on stage. And, um, you know, it was, it would take an hour to do the prosthetics. Wow. You know, and um, then, and that's before anything else could happen. And then I would do the makeup afterwards. So, um, yeah, but I mean, you know, it was great because she, it, she looked different, you know, um, yeah. Sounds amazing. I can't believe she, she wore them to events as well. Yeah, well, I remember being at the Grammys with her and she sort of arrived in this egg, you know, which must have been pretty hot inside. And, you know, yes, full on prosthetics again, you know, yeah. I want to go back a little bit because you mentioned that Botox Beauty that you did with Lee. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting that this was kind of happening in a, a certain time, but now we're very much in this kind of Instagram age of beauty um, and Botox seems to be kind of incredibly prevalent. It, at the time it was kind of a novel idea, but now this whole idea of kind of fixing and smushing and using makeup as a tool to change your face is completely, um, completely of the norm. I'm really interested to see, ask even, how you feel that kind of makeup has changed and for better or for worse, perhaps through an Instagram lens. I think, um, I think it's an incredible journey and it's got to happen. It's, it's the normality as we move more towards our robotic selves. Mm. You know, I think it's, uh, it's just a natural progression. Um, you know, I think we'll all end up looking the same. You know, it'll be the same mouth, the same nose, you know, um, <clears throat> the same boobs. Um, I think it's exciting. I think I've always liked the science of beauty mm. and um, yeah, what if, why not, you know? I mean, we're even making foundations now that, you know, and, and eye, eyebrows that, um, you can use eyebrow products that will, that will sort of like semi-tattoo for however long, you know, whether that's, you know, two nights or two months or forever. Mm. You know, microblading, you know, the idea of tattooing your eyebrows, you know, 10 years ago, you would think, are you mad? But everybody does it now, you know, and it's like, there are lots of um, Asian um, young girls who, you know, for their birthday, like say it's their 18th birthday, they have plastic surgery done, you know, whether it's to, you know, augment their eyes or, or, or lengthen their jaws or chins or whatever. Mm. It's, it's become so normal now, you know, and it's the way it is, it's the future, you know. Yeah. And also this idea of, I think Instagram also lends itself not only to this kind of future vision of what beauty should be, but a kind of how to, how to get that. There's so many tutorials, everyone's almost a, a 
base level makeup artist, you could say, nowadays, but I think that takes away from this energy that we've just been talking about of gut visceral reactions. Well, I think, um, yes, everybody is, everybody is an expert today. Great. I remember Nick Knight saying to me, um, because when, um, when Show Studio first started, um, Nick, Nick has always filmed. He's always filmed in the studio. Um, but we would never allow him into our room. He was not allowed into the makeup room. Because we, I didn't want him to see my process. I, well, I, I just want to be in my process. It's like if I'm doing something, I don't even, I don't talk to the model because I'm working it out. I'll talk before or after, but mm. when I'm in the moment, you're in the moment. And um, anyway, Nick said, like, I want to do a film of you. I want to do a film of you doing makeup. And I'm like, why? Why would anybody ever want to watch somebody else applying eyeliner? How boring. <laughs> How wrong was I? How wrong was I? You know, now it's everywhere. But um, what I do hope, and I think, yeah, um, with everybody showing their process on how to do whatever, how to do a liner, how to block a brow, what have you, um, I hope that there will always be the freaks. You know, freaks like me, like I was. You know, people that don't want to look like anybody else. You know, um, I don't think we should all have the same eyebrow, you know. Individuality should always reign. You know, that should be the supreme ding-dong moment, you know. <laughs> and that's, speaking of ding-dong moment, um, this kind of individuality is very much something I feel like you teach. You have a wonderful um, knack for kind of teaching and giving the gift of that individuality, individuality, that energy, and particularly with the television programme Glow Up, it's interesting to see you kind of trying to pull out that reaction from, from kind of young makeup artists today. So hopefully that will be the, that will be the case. Well, I hope so. And um, because I, I'll say it again, um, you can be taught how to do something, but a visionary just feels it, you know, because I, um, uh, I remember a few years ago, I did the very first online makeup school. <coughs> I think Nick was involved with it for mm -hmm. photography as well. Um, and I remember um, the producers of the show sort of saying to me like, you know, we have to teach them in sort of like step by step that you know there has to be a reason why we do things and you know these people are given a brief you know they go away they study they do their makeup then we photograph it and then you judge it and I would say oh I like that one I like that one that's the one and the, and you know it was like yes but you know she didn't even really think about it you know and Sometimes what's there to think about? Sometimes it's just slash and it's the most incredible moment ever, you know. I remember I was doing, I was working with Tim Walker and um, I got to do um, Kate Blanchett with him and um, Kate Blanchett always uses Mary Greenwell and I respect that and that's amazing. <coughs> that's her makeup artist. And um, we were doing this shoot, and um, there was this one moment where Julian Deese was doing the hair, and he'd sort of piled this amazing creation on the top. And Kate was wearing very natural makeup, and this incredible couture Yoji gown. And Tim had started shooting, and I said, um, Tim, can I do something? And he's like, yeah, what do you want to do? <coughs> and I said, well, I'd like to just take this sort of little paint roller and just sort of like 
roll paint up Kate's body onto her face. What do you think? And he was like, well, if she's up for it. And um, so I just went up to Kate and I just sort of said, look, you know, um, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, I'm just going to roll this paint roller up your face. Um, it might work, it might not. What do you think? And she's like, go for it. And, you know, it was, and Tim's there ready to take the picture and it was just like, okay, done. And I like that because it's just, you know, and it's also what I like about it is that incredible pressure of it could all go horribly wrong. And I think that's the dark side of me that goes <laughs> like, I could fuck this up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a perfect note to end on Val Garland. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>